welcome to Norlina Baptist Church. It's Easter Sunday morning, and we're here to share with you today, and we're so glad that you joined us. So to start off our service today, we've asked Miss Deborah to play He Lives, hymn 533. If you happen to have a hymnal, sing along with her. Today I want to speak to you about the character of God and that God is love. So if you would, if you have your copy of God's holy, infallible, and errant word, find your way into the book of John and to the third chapter, which should be very familiar with many of you in the third chapter of John. To begin with, in chapter 3 of John, we have a man named Nicodemus, reading from chapter 3, verse 1 and following. Now there's a man was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. That verse alone tells us that he was an aristocrat, as it were, part of the ruling party, uh, a man of statue. And this man came to him by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Friends, you ought to circle that word, we. That means Nicodemus was not alone in his belief that Jesus was who he said he was. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And you should note there the change of subject. Nicodemus is talking about one thing, but Jesus moves him on to the crucial element that he needs him to understand. So Nicodemus said to him, How can you be born when he was old? He cannot enter a second time in his mother's womb and be born, can he? But Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. My friends, Jesus has just outlined the whole process of becoming a child of God, that, which is the one part of the two-part process. The second part picks up in verse 14. And Moses, Moses lifted up the serpent of the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I want to unfold for you today, my friends, this whole process that Jesus is outlining in this very familiar passage. One, you have to be born again to have eternal life. And two, God sent his son down to make that provision. Having said that, I want to pose it this to you. There are those of you who have hurt and or been hurt in unimaginable ways. You might feel that your experience excludes you from the opportunity to have this love that God is unfolding by sending his son. You might feel that because of your past experience that you can never be loved ever again. But here's a note for you. Here's a truth for you. God is love. And it's a character issue. It is who God is. You need to hear this, even though many of you may have heard it before. You need to hear that you are precious in the eyes of Father God. You need to hear that you are priceless in the heart of the Father. And the Father already has everything. 
But to him, you are priceless. There is a difference, my friends, though, in having heard that you are loved and believing that you are loved. You may have grown up in an environment where you heard that God is loved, but did you then and do you now really believe it? I know that I've heard the critics and they unfold and say, well, God is loved and why this and why that? We're not going to talk about the evil side of this today. We're going to talk about the love side. And the challenge here for us is that if you don't know how to recognize and receive this unconditional, undying, unwavering love of God, then you will never be able to know with certainty when he is speaking to you or leading you by his Holy Spirit. Because to grasp this, to understand it, to get our arms around it, we need to know the same thing that Nicodemus had to find out that Jesus was trying to get him to see in pointing out to him that, that as a teacher in Israel in verse 10, you don't understand these things when he should have. But to help us understand it, I want to pose it three things to you today. I'm going to unfold three major principles having to do with this love of God. The first of which is the price paid determines the value. The price paid determines the value. If we're going to figure out what something is worth, the price has everything to do with it. And Jesus, in teaching about this in Matthew 13, 44, and I read, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now Jesus is trying to teach us here how to understand the value of the kingdom of heaven. To help us understand that what heaven is all about, he is unfolding this parable. This man found this great treasure on this piece of property, and he hid it in the ground. And when he found it, he was so excited that he had found this thing on this piece of property that he reburied it on that same piece of property. Then he went out to sell everything that he had in order to buy that piece of property. Now put yourself in his place. Can you imagine you being there? You could if you knew that there was this great treasure buried there. Now imagine, he's coming home. He tells his wife, says, we need to sell everything that we have. All the stuff that we have, everything it is, and we're going to take that money and we're going to go buy a piece of land. We're getting rid of everything. The furniture, the dishes, the clothes, the cars, even your mama. Well, I didn't mean that really. It all has to go. Whoa, she said, wait a minute. What's gotten into you? Why are you selling all of our stuff? Well, sweetheart, I'm going to sell all our stuff because I'm going to go buy a piece of real estate. I'm going to go buy a field. Well, of course, your wife doesn't understand about the treasure. She is probably going to begin thinking that her family was right all along about you and want to have you committed. But if anyone else is walking by that field, they also don't understand either. All they do is see rocks and grass. They don't know about the treasure. But because this man, he knows, he sees the hidden treasure beneath the surface, he is willing to pay everything in order to get and own that piece of land. He is willing to pay everything he owns in order to have it. Once the man owns the field, that worthless patch of grass now becomes worth everything to him. Why? Because he has paid everything for it. In other words, my friends, the price paid determined the value. In the case of Jesus, he paid it all. The second point you, whoever you may are, you are worth the price paid. In 1 Corinthians 6, 20, we find, For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. You were bought with a price. I ask you, my friends, let that sink in. Let that sink into the very psyche that someone gave all that he had so that he could have all of you. You may look at yourself and you see worthlessness. Who would do that? Who would give all 
all they had for me. Who cares enough to give away everything just to have you? Well, the answer to that question is really pretty easy. God. God does. God Almighty. The totally sovereign creator of all the heavens and all the earth. The God who just said things and things were made. They were there. They just came into being because he spoke it. The God who's totally omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent everywhere at all times. This God who is omnipotent, all-powerful, loved you so much that he wanted to give everything for you. He is so much in love with you that he said you were worth the price that he paid. And what is that price? Well, it's the life of his son, Jesus. Really? The value, my friend, comes when you start to think about the fact that Jesus left the most indescribable place ever thought of by man, and that's heaven. A place that's so wonderful you and I can't get our arms around it. The Bible, in its very best, the Holy Spirit writing through men, only did their best to describe it. And we say it, we can't even imagine the words that they use, and it's better than all of that. Jesus left that. He left that. He came to earth. He lived here 33 and a half years. He taught. He healed people. He loved people. But it was the death of his son Jesus that was the price. His death was the sacrifice for all time. His death bore the physical stripes of the beatings that he had to endure. A death that was an agonizing pain of crucifixion on a cross. A cross being the most cruel form of punishment ever devised by man up until that time. A public humiliation. But he did it willingly. A death that was paid by the price of his spilt blood. But in paying the price, Jesus is crying out to you, I love you. I have loved you before the foundations of the earth. Maybe you look in the mirror of life every day and there just seems to be a sense of worthlessness. There is a remembrance of your past actions, times in your life when you just couldn't get it together. You didn't do right. There is also this mental anguish for the sins that you have committed and may be committing even this day. There are memories that you carry of a very ugly childhood, of maybe abuse. But if you were to fix your eyes on the treasure hidden beneath the surface, then you would see the real you. The real you that is loved with a love this world does not even comprehend. You know the world love that most people are familiar with in the world says, if you do for me, I'll do for you. If you don't do for me, I won't do for you. But look at what the psalmist writes to God in Psalm 139, 14 through 16. He writes, I will give thanks to you, speaking to God, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth, your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book, were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. God says, what I did for you, I did before you ever even knew. 1 John 4.10 describes that, and that this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's the sacrifice for our sins. But hold the train, friends. Hold the train. Because something else happened that fateful day. Jesus went to the cross willingly to pay the price for us, to be our substitute. But God didn't leave him in the grave. It was the resurrection of his son Jesus that proved 
that he is the divine one, that he sits at the right hand of God to intercede on our behalf. Christianity is the only worship faith on this earth that has a live Savior even today. He didn't stay in the grave, folks. He went there, yes. And when you take on that belief, you get what Nicodemus was taught. You are born again. And you can be born again because of what he taught Nicodemus and his son going to the cross. And God resurrected him. The third point I want you to grab today is the price of knowledge is experience. The price of knowledge is experience. If you want to know God, you need to understand his great love. To understand his great love, you need to experience it. To experience it, you must believe it. You must believe he is the Son of God. You must believe that God is who he says he is. John 6, 28 and 29 tells us, Therefore they said to him, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. My friends, the work of God for us is to believe. That's our task. That's what's before us. Not understanding God's love is only knowing about God, but it's not knowing God. Can we really understand God's love for us? Ephesians 3, 17 tells us that we can. It unfolds that, that it says that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up with all the fullness of God. <clears throat> My mere knowledge, friends, that head knowledge of God is shallow Christianity. It lacks the understanding and the depth of his love. If we understand God's love, what it means is to have a working knowledge of what it is, a working knowledge of where it came from, a working knowledge of what it does, and a working knowledge of how to use it. We understand God's love as we believe, and as we believe, we experience it. <coughs> Excuse me. And finally, I once read, never let anyone else, what anyone else has done to you, be bigger than what God has done for you. <coughs> Are you living your life based on what someone else has said to you? What someone else has done to you? What you think someone else has done to you? What has happened in your past that severely damaged your ability to know and feel love? The best and most sure way out of hurt is to begin to believe in your heart what I've been trying to tell you. God loves you. <coughs> you got to get past what you think you know and begin to believe God and his love on a whole new level. You need to stop thinking about what you have or haven't done. Begin thinking about what he has done. Solely motivated by his love, Jesus paid the highest price for you and for me. And to him, friends, you're worth it. You're worth it. You may not know him, but he knows you. But you can know him. I want to offer you this invitation today. <clears throat> if you would just admit that God is who he says he is, face the reality that you are a sinner before God. Repent of that sin. Just bow your head and pray, Lord, I'm a sinner. I recognize that. And I believe that you sent your son and he died on the cross and you raised him. And he stands to intercede for me if I will only believe. I believe. Let me close with this, friends. How do I know God loves me? How do I know he loves you? I believe the Bible, God's Word. And the Bible tells me He does. May you have a great Easter. May God richly bless all of you and your family.